Uh, today, I'm going to tell you a true story about the summer of 2009, which changed my life. Um, I was a student here in Manchester. I was 18 years old. And uh, that summer, I went to work on a kids' camp in America. Now, um, you may know someone who's done this. There's various reasons people go to work on these kids' camps. Some people want to sort of boost their CV or get experience working with children or just travel the world. Um, I had my own reasons, very similar. Um, I wanted to, to uh, lose my virginity. Uh, that was the, um, I just had that on me all the time. Uh, and no one wanted it. So I thought what I'd do is I'd... <laughs> uh, I thought... <laughs> it's fun now, isn't it? Funny now. Um, but I thought I'd go to America, basically, because in America I had a superpower. I had this accent, you know, and I thought that'd be a, a bit of an aphrodisiac. Um, so, <laughs> Spoiler alert, um, didn't work, came back a virgin, more so, if anything. Uh, actually went to prom with a 14-year-old boy. Uh, so, but that was my plan initially. I went over there to, to reinvent myself, to be like a different Steve, you know, because no one at the summer camp would know me. But, you know, they didn't know I was a loser at school. They didn't know I was a geek, did they? They didn't know I cried at Laser Quest because it was too dark. They didn't know, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so dark, isn't it? But I, I, that was my plan, and uh, an organization called Camp America, um, they sort of sorted it all out. They, they work with all these camps in America, and then they fly out British um, uh, virgins to go and work on the... Um, <laughs> it's like sex trafficking, but in, in a good way. And, I, and I, I got placed in a camp called Round Lake Camp. Now, Round Lake Camp was a camp for teenagers with autism. Uh, now, it was a, quite a small camp. It had like a sports field and a, a little lake. Uh, uh, had a nature reserve, uh, which consisted of a llama and a rabbit. Uh, and then it had cabins where the adults would live with the campers. Now, I was put into cabin seven, along with two other adults, Tom and Hobsey. Now, Tom, he'd been the year before. He was the nicest guy in the world. He was so, so helpful and friendly. Uh, and as a result, he doesn't really feature in the rest of this story. Um, <laughs> hard luck, Tom. Uh, Hobbsy, though, Hobbsy does feature. Hobbsy was the opposite of me. He was an alpha male, you know, real confident, privately educated, proper, posh boy, you know, sexually active. Uh, and he, he was one of, he was like, oh my God, Steve, we're going to have so much banter. Ha, 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 real arsehole. Uh, and, and we had three campers to look after. They arrived on the, on the, the second day, and uh, um, Zach was uh, Tom's camper. Um, Alec was, 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 uh, was Hobbsy's camper. He, Alec arrived in a full suit. And I was like, wow, you two are going to get on great. Uh, and then there was my camper, CJ. Now, CJ was 14 years old. And the first thing I noticed about CJ is he was taller than me, um, wider than me, and looked significantly older uh, than me, which wasn't ideal. Um, I sort of picked his suitcase up and nervously went into the cabin. And then when I came out, what I saw CJ doing next made me realize that I had the most incredible camper. Right? CJ was walking in a giant circle on the grass, uh, and he was reciting an entire episode of SpongeBob SquarePants, uh, verbatim. All of the characters, all the right voices. It was incredible. But the best thing about it was other campers noticed, noticed he was doing it and just started following behind, just like listening along to the episode and laughing at all the jokes. It was like Netflix meets Conga. It was beautiful, right? <laughs> it's a thing called echolalia. Uh, it's very common with autism, uh, where they're able to retain huge amounts of language and they kind of store it in a hard drive and then regurgitate it back out again out of context. Now, CJ did it with SpongeBob SquarePants. There was another kid who did it with Sex and the City. It was, it was a lot less wholesome. Uh, but <laughs> uh, I, I put his uh, suitcase on the bed and I started unpacking his clothes and I noticed the suitcase was pretty much full of roadmaps, uh, American roadmaps. And it turned out CJ loved roadmaps. He'd study them for hours every single day and he had an incredible skill. CJ had memorized all the major roads in the United States of America. So you could ask him how to get from any point to any other point, and he'd tell you which route to use. I was looking at him going, wow, you are incredible. I've got the best camper. I was so excited. I was looking at Hobbsy with his rubbish kid. He'd just have a suit. My kid is a sat-nav, you know? <laughs> now, autism is a broad spectrum. Um, CJ had a very particular type of autism called hypersensitive ASD, 
which basically just meant that his brain didn't filter out the stimuli from the world. You know, the noises, the smells, the, the lights. Um, whereas a neurotypical brain filters it out and makes it bearable for us. His didn't, and, and that was what his autism was. Now, I remember the first day, the first activity of camp was to go swimming on the, in the lake. And I, we all went down to the lake, and Hobbsy got down there, and he was like, oh, my God, this reminds me so much of my garden. Ha, ha, ha. And, <laughs> real arsehole. And, uh, and uh, CJ loved swimming, right? CJ loved swimming, but he could not swim, which is a dangerous uh, combination. So... <laughs> He wanted to learn, though. He wanted to learn to swim, and that was his aim for the summer, and it was my job as his uh, as adult to, to, to teach him to swim, and I was, you know, I was excited to teach him, and I remember the first sort of lesson of swimming. Uh, CJ, he, he put his foot into the water, uh, and then he removed his foot from the water, and he announced that swimming was over for the day. <laughs> and he used the best excuse. I couldn't combat it. He said he was now too wet to swim. Uh, <laughs> Fair play. I thought I had a great camper, right? I thought I'd lucked out. I was going to have the best summer of my life. Uh, the first night came around and CJ's behavior started to deteriorate. Uh, the campus was supposed to be asleep in the, in the cabin behind us, and me and Hobbsy were on the porch. Uh, we were chatting to Lara, who worked in the, uh, the cabin next to us. She was uh, beautiful, perfect. I probably should have uh, married her. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and Hobbsy was, was kind of chatting, or, you know, sort of flirting with her. It was a bit cringe, you know, sort of, you know, sort of doing jokes, and she was sort of giggling and playing with her hair. <laughs> Get the message, mate. She is not interested, right? So, I... <laughs> pathetic. So, um, I was there, and Zach comes out of the cabin, one of the campers, and he looks slightly distressed, and he says something that I didn't expect to hear. Uh, he announced, um, uh, Mr. Stephen, um, CJ is masturbating, and he's commentating on it. And I was like, oh, oh this wasn't in the training. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know what to do. I was only 18, <laughs> and, but I had to do it. He's my camper. So I went into a, a cabin to tell another teenager to stop masturbating, which seemed hypocritical at best. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know what you were doing in this situation. The first mistake I made was I turned the light on, gave him the spotlight that he craved. The second mistake I did was I said, I said, CJ, what are you doing? He said, I'm masturbating. And I was like, I oh. kind of cool my bluff there a little bit. Uh, but his behavior got worse and worse. I didn't know what to do. The next day, he, um, he punched a llama. Uh, yeah, you heard me. Uh, nothing prepares you for that. Uh, punched a llama square in the face, and the llama went down. Uh, he, he also scratched a nurse. Uh, he kicked one of the other campers a few days later. Uh, he, he was sort of out of control, and I, I just wasn't very good at my job. I, I couldn't communicate with him, and I, I couldn't control him, and I was hating it. I, I sort of wanted to go home. It got to the 4th of July, and they were having a big fireworks display for Independence Day. And CJ was desperate to go to the firework display. And I knew this was a terrible idea, because right? it would be loud and bright, it would be a sensory overload for him and would cause a meltdown, but he was insistent on going. So we went to this firework display, and we sat on the bleachers, and we watched it, and they started huge explosions. And I looked over at CJ, and he wasn't kicking off. He wasn't. He wasn't rocking side to side. He wasn't staring at the floor. He was staring upwards at, at, at the display. He was mesmerized by the fireworks. The next 10 minutes were the best behaved he'd been the entire time we'd been there. And I, I just couldn't understand it. I was like, how is this not setting you off? This is unsettling me. Like, you got set off by a llama yesterday. Like, it makes no sense. And I, I started to piece it together. Because in our training, the main mantra they gave us was they said, all behavior is communication. All behavior is them trying to tell you something. And uh, I started to work out a pattern between when he behaved well and when he didn't. And I, I realized there was a correlation between when he behaved well and when he was visually stimulated. When he was visually engaged with something, he was much calmer and much better behaved. And that's why he enjoyed the fireworks, because they're bright. And that's why he loved roadmaps, because they're, they're colorful. And that's why he loved SpongeBob SquarePants, because it's larger than life. It, it visually stimulated him. So once I worked that out, it was like a cheat code for CJ's behavior. I just sort of made a few tweaks to the way we did things around uh, the day's activities. Uh, for example, you know, every activity, he just took a map 
with him. So if he got unsettled, he would just read his map for a bit. Or if he got really restless, he would go back to the cabin and watch SpongeBob SquarePants. And his behavior improved dramatically. It, it was incredible. It was like a different person. And so much so that we actually were able to teach him to swim. And it was the most uh, gratifying experience I've ever had. Uh, he, he, it was a long process teaching him to swim. And, and the way we actually did it is uh, we found an episode of SpongeBob SquarePants where they swam and he watched it over and over again and then he translated that into the water. Um, and by the way, finding an episode of SpongeBob SquarePants where they swam was surprisingly difficult given it is set under the sea. Um, we had to find an episode where they went to a swimming pool. It was ridiculous. But, <laughs> but CJ, he, he did learn and it was, it was brilliant. And CJ, me and, um, CJ and me were different in one very key way. I, I was a very insecure 18-year-old, I was obsessed with what people thought about me, and I didn't want to be me, really. I wanted to be a different version of me, a cooler version to fit in more. Whereas CJ, 14 years old, he didn't care what people thought of him. He never bothered him. He just did what he wanted to do. He was happy being CJ. There was one day that really highlights this for me. We went to a, a theme park, Hershey Park, the biggest theme park in, in Pennsylvania, and uh, oh, the, the campus was so excited. We, we hired a minibus and uh, we, we drove there, and Hobbsy was entertaining them in the bus. He was, he was running like a quiz for the campus, you know, asking all posh questions. You know, he's like, oh, what's the best way to avoid tax? You know, like classic uh, posh <laughs> questions. Real arsehole. And uh, he uh, they got to the, the, the theme park, and CJ didn't want to go to on any of the roller coasters. Wasn't interested in any roller coaster whatsoever. Uh, the highlight of CJ's day was those giant maps you get at theme parks with all the rides shown, and then you'll know them that the map will have a little arrow and it will say, you are here. This blew CJ's mind. Because he'd never seen a map before that showed him where he was on the map. Like his maps didn't do that. The first time he saw it, it was like, oh my God. How does it know? That's right, I am here. I am here, Stephen, I'm here, I'm here. And he got so excited, he spent the whole day just going through every single map and just checking they were correct. Like every single time, he'd get more and more excited, like, I'm here, I'm here, this one's right too, Steve, I'm here, I'm here. And every time he did it, more and more people would point and laugh at him, but CJ didn't care. He didn't care what people thought, he just was doing his thing, he was happy being CJ, looking at the giant maps. The rest of the summer went by quite quickly. Uh, his behavior got loads better. There was occasionally the odd slip up. You know, I would miss the signs and uh, another llama would have to be sacrificed. But <laughs> I, CJ is the best person I've ever met. I spent every single day with him. And we got to the end of uh, camp and it was time for prom. Uh, and everyone wants a date for prom. CJ was no different. He asked out every girl, every boy, and, and unfortunately got a negative response. But luckily for him, I also had a similar uh, predicament. So uh, Lara went with Hobbsy. I just didn't see it coming. Uh, and I, <laughs> they actually ended up dating for three years. I think she just sort of felt sorry for him. But the, I, me, and, uh, me, me and CJ went to prom. That's how I went to prom with a 14-year-old boy. And, uh, and this prom wasn't like any other disco I've ever been to, by the way, because the, the kids didn't obey the social norms. They didn't care. They, there was one girl who just sat in the middle of the dance floor playing Connect Four on her own. That's genius. You can't lose, right? The, uh, th there was another kid who just counted the mirrors in the disco ball, but the disco ball was moving, so he lost count uh, regularly. Um, CJ just sat at the back, just reading his maps, like so, so happy. Th th they were incredible. It, it was the last day, and the parents came to pick them up, and uh, it was really sad, you know, you got to know these kids and love them. And I um, said goodbye and uh, I met CJ's dad. And uh, he was, I told him that CJ had learned to swim and he, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe his son had learned to swim. He was so grateful and it felt incredible. Uh, and then I had to give him some vet bills for some llamas. And, um, <laughs> and I said goodbye to CJ. Um, and that's the last time I ever saw him. He, he gave me a little present to remember him by. He gave me one of his uh, maps, uh, Pennsylvania map, and I've always kept it as a little souvenir. I mean, I can't really use it. The pages are stuck together, but um, the, I, um, I, I, it's, still, it's nice to have it. Um, But the next day is the day that changed my life, because the, the campers had all gone. It was just the staff left, and they organized a staff talent contest. Um, and I entered the staff talent contest, and I did stand-up comedy for the very first time. And um, 
I, I'd always like, loved stand-up comedy. I thought it was the most incredible art form, um, but I never thought in a million years I would do it. I was the sort of shy, self-conscious one. I wasn't the one who got on stage and made people laugh, but I had just spent six weeks with CJ, and, and he had sort of just shown me not to care so much about what people think of you, uh, and I just did it. Uh, I guess I did reinvent myself at the end, but just not based on what other people's perceptions are. And, and that was my first gig doing stand-up, and I actually won the talent contest, and now I'm a professional comedian. It's kind of um, CJ's fault. Uh, but I'm very grateful, and um, because I was doing this talk, uh, I, uh, I haven't seen CJ, right, since, since 2009, and I think about him all the time. I wonder what he's doing. And I thought, well, I'll find out. I'll find out. It'll be a nice ending for the talk. I'll, I'll find out what he's doing. So I searched him on Facebook. It took me ages to find him. And I eventually met, I found him and I messaged him out of the blue. It was a bit creepy, to be honest. I was like, hello, do you remember me? It's your, it's your prom date from 2009. And, uh, <laughs> and CJ messaged back and we got chatting. And uh, you'll never believe what CJ does now. This is incredible. CJ now is an Olympic swimmer. Nah, he's not, I'm joking. Um, I, 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 imagine if he was, imagine, what an ending. I wouldn't be here, I'd be a flipping swimming teacher, I'm a genius. Um, but, <laughs> Some of you were like, oh, what, really? Wow. No, CJ actually works uh, for Nickelodeon, uh, developing their cartoons, because he knows more about cartoons than anyone else in the world, I imagine, uh, and, he, and he's very, um, happy. I, I told him what I did, uh, and uh, I said it was sort of down to him, and I said, thanks. Um, and Hobbsy, by the way, if you're wondering, Hobbsy and Lara broke up, uh, thankfully, very sad. Uh, and uh, Hobbsy now actually works for the National Autistic uh, Society, so real, um, real arsehole. Uh, I, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for having me, Manchester. I'll see you again soon. Thank you.